أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أذلك خير أم جنة الخلد التي وعد المتقون كانت لهم جزاء ومصيرا بعدا مسؤولا ويوم يحشرهم وما يعبدون من دون الله فيقول فيقول أأنتم أضللتم عبادي هؤلاء أم هم ضلوا السبيل قالوا سبحانك ما كان ينبغي لنا أن نتخذ من دونك ما كان ينبغي لنا أن نتخذ من دونك من أولياء ولكن متعتهم ولكن متعتهم وآباءهم حتى نسوا الذكر وكانوا قوما بورا فقد كذبوكم بما تقولون فما تستطيعون صرفا فما تستطيعون صرفا ولا نصرا ومن يظلم منكم نذقه عذابا كبيرا <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين إن شاء الله we'll be starting from ayah number 15 a translator writes for ayah number 15, say, which is better, this or the lasting garden that those who are mindful of God have been promised as their reward and journey's end. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qul. And he commands the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to say, to respond with, adhalika, is that better and now, the that, we talked about this yesterday as well. What is it referring to? What is it talking about? So many of the Mufassirun have talked about what can, what, what possibly is that pointing to? What is that referring to? And so some of the Mufassirun um, have mentioned that the dhalika, the pointing word, that, ismul ishara, that it's, pointing to um, the requests, or, or rather, excuse me, the demands that were made, the objections that were raised by the disbelievers. Where they said, لَوْ لَا أُنْزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مَلَكٌ فَيَكُونَ مَعَهُ نَذِيرًا أَوْ يُلْقَى إِلَيْهِ كَنْزٌ أَوْ تَكُونُ لَهُ جَنَّةً يَأْكُلُ مِنْهَا Right, so these demands that were, they, these, these objections and these demands that were made by the disbelievers towards the Prophet Wasallam, that why does an angel come down to him? Why isn't a huge treasure dumped in front of him? Why um, does he not have a garden, etc., etc.? That the dhalik is going back to that. Some of us have mentioned rather what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, what we talked about in number 10, Tabaraka Ladi Insha Aja Alaka Khairam min Dalika Janat in Tajiri, Min Tahti al and Harwe Ja Alaka Kusuran, that those Mufasirun who said that this refers to if God wanted to, he could have given you all of this in the life of this world. He could have given you gardens, he could have given you palaces and castles in this dunya. That the Dalika is going back to that. That having gardens and having palaces and castles in this dunya, is that better? And some of us, uh, such as Ibn Ashud and others, rahimahullah ta'ala, they say rather it's referring to the fate of the disbelievers in the life of the hereafter. What we talked about yesterday. Ulqu minha makanan dayyiqan. That they will be dumped. They'll be tossed inside of a very tight, constricted place. That that's what it's referring to. And the majority of the Mufassirun seem to lean in this direction that they say that that is actually what it's alluding to and what it's referring to. That it's ending up in a very terrible place, like we talked about in detail yesterday in the previous session. Is ending up in such a terrible place in, the, in hell, is that better? Or... 
قُلْ أَذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ أَمْ جَنَّةُ الْخُلْدِ Or is the garden of eternity? It, what's better? The fire of hell? Or the gardens of paradise? Now obviously it's a rhetorical question because the answer is obvious. Now there's two, again, curiosities that I'll point out here. Number one, I'll point out one of the, one of the more literal things that's right there in the language. Jannatul Khuld, and again the students will some, somewhat, you know, if you look at it, you'll see what's going on there. Jannatul Khuldi, what is it? It's an idafa, the garden of eternity, right? It's obviously talking about paradise and life of the hereafter. And the following ayat, the next coming ayat, in fact ayah number 16, talks about the fact that they'll be in paradise for all of eternity. Paradise is for eternity. That's an established fact, we know that. So what exactly is the purpose of then saying that it's the garden of eternity? When the eternalness of paradise in the life of the hereafter is already known, understood, implied. Then why does it have to be explicitly stated? Is that a level of redundancy? Somebody could ask. So this is not redundancy, but rather it's emphasis. It's emphasis. And this is a very common style in the Arabic language that when you want to emphasize something, then you explicitly mention it. All right? So, for instance, when, and, and a very basic example that's given by Imam al Razi, rahimahullahu ta'ala, is that, for instance, Allah being Rahman and Rahim, we know that already. Okay, maybe we need it to be told that the very first time. Right? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Or Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. Now we know that Allah is Rahman and He is Rahim. But constantly the Quran will mention that Allah is Rahman and Rahim. And we don't call that redundancy, but that is emphasis. And that's mentioned at a particular point in time, usually when it needs to be emphasized. Because there's something key that it's communicating. Maybe, it, maybe somebody's in a very diff, the circumstance at the time of the Prophet is very difficult. The believers are struggling. There's a lot of adversity. And so Allah will remind them, inspire hope to them by reiterating, by re-emphasizing His mercy. So while the believers are dealing with this onslaught, as I mentioned previously in the previous sessions, of the disbelievers pointing out to them that y'all are so miserable in this world, you are a minority, you are an embattled, persecuted minority. You're struggling. You don't have any resources available to you. And on and on and on. And they're really just pounding them with this. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala realizes that what they need to inspire hope within them, they need to be reminded that this is a very short duration of life that involves sacrifice and some challenges and difficulties and adversities. But what follows this, and what is the result and consequence of this, as this ayah says, كَانَتْ لَهُمْ جَزَاءً وَمَصِيرًا That what follows this is eternal bliss, and happiness, and peace, and tranquility, and serenity. For all of eternity, forever and ever. So that's why it's being emphasized. The second thing here that I wanted to point out, is that rhetorically speaking, and um, philo philosophically speaking, it's saying what's better, right? And this is khayrun in the Arabic language, is what we call ismu tafdil. It's ismu tafdil. The way to explain that is that you would ask, right? If there are two people, um, one person is 50 years old and one person is 60 years old. And, and about the 60 year old, you say that huwa akbaru minhu. He is older in age. He is older in age than he is. And in order to even present that scenario, if you, if you had a 60-year-old and a 6-year-old, and then you say, well, who's older? Somebody would look at you like, what are you talking about? It's common sense, of course. Right? But if some, one person 50, one person 60, and the person asks who's older, then it's a legitimate, reasonable question. All right? So that's the comparative noun, ismu tafdil. So over here it's saying, what's better? What's better? Hell or paradise? And so somebody could object by saying that, 
Well, just the question implies that there's something good about hell. Because hell is terrible, paradise is great. And so you say, which one is better? You're implying that there's some good in hell. So how do we exactly understand that? How do you logically respond to that? So again, this goes back to a lack of familiarity with the Arabic language. So when you look at this from the perspective of the Arabic language, you see that there was a very common style in the, um, there was a very common style amongst the Arabs that they would respond, that they would, when they would talk about sometimes to emphasize the goodness of something, they would use the comparative noun. But the idea there was not to compare the two. But it was more to point out to somebody how obvious the choice here is. That it's not implying that there's something good about one of the two choices, but rather it's to point out how obvious the choice here is. And how one is obviously good and the other is not. And furthermore, some of the scholars, they comment by saying, وَالتَّفْضِيلُ فِي مَوْقِعِ الْآيَةِ مُسْتَعْمَلٌ لِلْتَحَكُمْ بِالْمُشْرِكِينَ Further, some of the mufassirun, some of the scholars of the Qur'an, they comment by saying that even using this type of language, that which one do you think is better? Is very deliberately, it's, it's in a very deliberate style. It's in the style of comparative and asking which is better. It's very deliberately in this style. And it is for the purpose of mocking those who do not believe in the life of the hereafter. It is to call them out. It is to ridicule them. It is to point out their foolishness and their stupidity to them. That this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reprimanding them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking in a very harsh tone. Alright? So that is a second curiosity here that some scholars have uh, raised when it comes to this particular ayah. And this is not the only place that this occurs within the Qur'an. In Surah Al-Safat, Ayah number 40, Allah says, أَفَمَنْ يُلْقَى فِي النَّارِ خَيْرٌ أَمَّنْ يَأْتِي آمِنَا الْيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Who's better? Who's in a better situation? The one who's dumped into the fire of hell head first? Or the one who arrives on the day of resurrection with peace and safety? Obviously, who's better? And so it's not to imply that there's something good about the person being thrown head first into the fire of hell, it's again to mock and ridicule that person. Why? We're not mocking and ridiculing someone who just didn't know any better or somebody who was you know, just uh, at a major disadvantage or something like that. We're, it's, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reprimanding, admonishing someone who was given every opportunity to understand, to realize. But that, but that person chose Falsehood over truth. That person wanted, decided to be stubborn and, and arrogant and conceited. And people like this, again, why does Allah, if Allah is Rahman Rahim, why is Allah speaking to them this way? Why is Allah speaking to His slaves, to His creation this way? Because these people, they mocked and they ridiculed the Prophet ﷺ. They oppressed and killed and tortured believers. They even mocked and ridiculed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they brought this on themselves. Now, furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ أَذَلِكَ خَيْنٌ أَمْ جَنَّةُ الْخُلْدِ الَّتِي وَعِدَ الْمُتَّقُونَ كَانَتْ لَهُمْ جَزَاءً وَمَصِيرًا That it will be, كَانَتْ لَهُمْ uh, Excuse me, الْجَنَّةُ الْخُلْدِ الَّتِي وَعِدَ الْمُتَّقُونَ So what's better? The fate mentioned for the disbelievers? Or... The, par the, the, the garden of eternity, paradise, is that better? That which was promised to those who lived the life of God consciousness. It was promised to those who lived the life of God consciousness. Alright? And this is of course talking about the fact that those who live a life of God consciousness, taqwa. Now we haven't talked about taqwa yet, and even though it's a very common topic and people are generally familiar with taqwa, but it's the first time that we're talking about in this surah, so I'll delve into it very, very briefly. Taqwa, is a, it's, it's been very tricky in terms of its translation in English. A lot of times people will translate it as fear, uh, or caution, or precaution. It's, it's an awareness, it's in, uh, a consciousness, a cognizance. And it specifically refers to being very aware and conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And something very beautiful that one of the Sahaba, you know, he commented, Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu, I believe, when he was asked to, to explain, to kind of give a visual for taqwa, how he perceived living a life of taqwa. He said that, you know, if you're wearing some very nice clothes, and imagine that you're particularly wearing a garment that is kind of like large and flowing, like a, like a thobe or something, like, or a dress or something like that. And you're walking through a pathway. And that pathway is littered with branches and, and uh, there's, there's thorny branches that are sticking out into the pathway and there's thorns and branches lying on the ground. How would you proceed to walk through that pathway? You would gather your clothes up, you would tiptoe, look very carefully where you're placing your foot because you don't want to step on the thorn. You would kind of twist and turn a little bit to avoid having your clothes get caught on any of the branches. And that's how you would navigate your way through. You wouldn't just bull rush, you know, the, the, through there. You wouldn't just plow through there because you would end up destroying your own clothes. And that's the visualization, that's the realization of what taqwa is like. And, and there's something very profound and beautiful and remarkable that he mentions in that, that taqwa is not, there's a misnomer, there's a misconception that taqwa is somehow like abstinence. To just abstain from everything. I'm not gonna go outside anymore. You know, there's, there's different challenges that exist outside, so I'm not gonna leave my house anymore. I'm just gonna Amazon everything to my house. I'm not gonna go outside anymore. Why taqwa? No, that's, that's probably a psychological disorder. You should have that checked. <laughs> right? And I don't mean to be insensitive, but that's, that's something else. That's not taqwa though. Alright? That's something else. You do walk the path. You just walk it carefully. Cautiously. When you drive a car, right? Somebody now might have a real fear or whatever it may be. But again, that's a different issue altogether. But accidents do happen. Right? Now, you don't stop driving the car, you just learn to drive a little bit more cautiously. Defensive driving. Where you're not only careful about yourself, you're careful about the other people on the road as well. You drive cautiously, you drive defensively. But you don't stop driving, That's an end, that'll, that'll put an end to whatever it is that you have to do. So you go through life, you go to work, and you come to the masjid, and you meet family, and you socialize. And you do whatever it is that you have to do, you just do it with a level of caution and precaution. And that caution that you learn to adopt is basically thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the right thing to do in this situation? What is the wrong thing to do? What is the appropriate thing to do? What would be inappropriate in this situation? What is pleasing to my master Allah in this circumstance? And what is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this situation? And that's the idea of taqwa. So those who lived, and Allah mentions them, He didn't say, وَعِدَا الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا He promised this, the garden of eternity, paradise of eternity, eternal paradise, He promised to those who practice God consciousness. But He says, those who are the God conscious people, He uses a noun to identify them. That this is their identifying trait. This is, this is the thing that sets them apart. This is their primary identity. That they live life with this level of caution, precaution. And that caution or precaution isn't, doesn't inhibit, doesn't obstruct, does not stunt their growth and their development and their ability and their opportunities. But it adds a level of dignity and honor and safety and security to their lives. وَعِدَ muttaqun. It was promised to them. Now, another thing that's a linguistic curiosity here, is that many places, it talks about, it uses it in the active sense. وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْمُتَّقِينَ وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْمُتَّقِينَ God promised this paradise to those who live a life of God consciousness. God promised it to them. That's not what it says here though. That is the meaning here, but that's not how it's communicating that meaning. It's saying that it was promised to them in the passive form. And why is it doing that? Couple of things, couple of reasons. Number one is 
Surah Al-Furqan, from the very get-go, from the very beginning, we've seen that it emphasizes the position of the Prophet ﷺ. As an authority in your life, as someone to listen to, someone to follow, someone to obey. The Qur'an, Tabarak Al-Ladhi Nazzal Al-Furqan, it's emphasizing the Qur'an, the significance of the Qur'an, the centrality of the Qur'an, the importance of the Qur'an. And then, uh, so one of the reasons why it's said in the passive mode is that it's been promised to them. Because it's been promised to them from multiple sources. Allah has promised it to them. Allah has revealed the Qur'an, in the Qur'an is a promise. That those who live a life of God consciousness, Allah will reward them. The Prophet ﷺ constantly emphasizes this to them. So by this way, by saying it in the passive, it includes everyone. And then the second reason that some of the scholars state why it's said in the passive, is that by saying it in the passive, what it does is, it puts more emphasis, calls more attention, kind of puts the focus on the people who live a life of God consciousness. Wu'ida, it has been promised to those who live a life of God consciousness. It's emphasizing them that the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. It's always been there. You have to make the decision to live a life of taqwa, to live a life of God consciousness in order to attain that promise, in order to benefit from that promise. So it's emphasizing you. And that's why the same ayah, and this fits with the theme of this particular ayah, the tone of the ayah, because what's the very next thing Allah says? Kanat lahum. Kanat is the feminine form, it's going back to paradise. Paradise is for them, those who live the life of God consciousness, jaza'an, as a reward, wa masiran, and as a final abode, a final destination. And here is another topic with a level of depth to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to paradise as their reward. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions paradise as their reward after referring to them as muttaqun, people who live a life of God consciousness. Now the reason why the topic I say has a little bit of depth here, this issue has some depth, is because we're all familiar with the very beautiful hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where the Prophet wasallam says, everyone will go to paradise by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa anta ya Rasulullah. The companion said, even you a messenger of God? He said, yes, even I. Wa ana. Even I will go to paradise through, by means of, by virtue of, through the blessing of, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we understand that. That God will enter people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will admit people into paradise. However, while we emphasize that not to become you know, strong-headed, not to become overconfident, not to become too sure of ourselves, that somehow I am in charge of everything, and I control everything, everyone and everything. But rather, it reminds us to be humble. Spiritual humility. That no matter how many good deeds I do have, and how much good I do try to do, and how hard I work, ultimately I am at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And my good, my best is still not good enough. Because of how much Allah has given me and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves from me. That being said, we also should not go to the opposite extreme. Because see, extremes in this regard, particularly in the area of belief, aqidah, beliefs, iman, and in spirituality, extremes are a very, very dangerous thing. And one, I constantly tell the students, one extreme breeds the other. So there were people who had a very fatalist type of mentality. That somehow, life, spirituality, belief, the hereafter is all like a mathematical equation. We're all just a bunch of accountants just doing hard math. And it's all like a numbers game. Good deeds, sins. Because we're going to lose that every single time. If that's the game we're playing, we're going to lose that game. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Manu al hisab faqad halak. Someone who, whom God decides to very 
precisely and intricately account and reckon, that person is done for. That person is a goner. Finished. The end. Because what Allah has given us and what Allah has graced us with and blessed us with, we can never fully, you know, pay back for it. But on the flip side, if somebody goes to the opposite extreme, that can lead to this mentality which also occurred. There, have been, there is a historical precedent for this of extreme, radical, deviant groups who started out on the fringes and eventually left the fold of Islam where they basically said actions and all of this, good deeds, bad deeds, none of it has any significance. Complete irja, what was called in classical terminology. Irja. Like none of this has any significance. It is what it is. And so that's also problematic. And we have a very, we have a very beautiful balance in the middle. Where yes, we are, at the, we are at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we qualify and we prove ourselves worthy of that mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through how hard we work. We will never be perfect. We'll never, get we'll never get it 100% right. But we will put forth our best effort. And by virtue of that effort and that sincerity, that hard work, we will prove ourselves worthy of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever gap remains, the mercy of Allah will fill that gap. And will carry us home. That's the idea here. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, just to give you a practical example, practical spirituality is very important. The Prophet ﷺ taught us that you pray. And the Prophet ﷺ said, فَأَحْسِنِ wudu'a." Do a good wudu, proper wudu. And then he taught us to focus. The Qur'an talks about khushu'a. Focus and concentration and humility and dedication in our prayer. And work hard in your prayer. Work hard at your prayer. And put forth the best prayer possible. But then when you're done with the prayer, what do you turn around and do? Istighfar. You ask God for forgiveness three times. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. And that's where that mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes in and hopefully has that prayer accepted. May Allah accept all of our prayers. So, كَانَتْ لَهُمْ جَزَاءً That paradise will be a reward for them. And, I, and I'll, I'll tackle one last little, um, you know, bit of rhetoric in our community sometimes. Again, extremes are very, very dangerous. And spiritual overzealousness is very problematic. Because when somehow you are more pious and you are more spiritual than even the Qur'an is, now you have a problem. Right? you have sp higher spiritual aspirations and goals than what the Qur'an gives you, then there's a little bit of a problem there. You have an issue. So this type of rhetoric as well, where it starts talking about like, that you know, not obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get to paradise, and somehow that that's like a lower aspiration. This type of rhetoric is not good and it's not healthy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كانت لكم This is a reward. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with being enticed and enticing and encouraging and incentivizing and motivating people through paradise and all the blessings that Allah promises. Lastly, Allah says, well, masiran, That will be their final abode and their final destination. Their journeys end. Because once somebody goes to paradise, then that's it. They'll never be deprived of that paradise ever again. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all from the people of paradise. The next ayah, ayah number 16. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَهُمْ فِيهَا مَا يَشَاءُونَ خَالِدِينَ كَانَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ وَعْدًا مَسْؤُولًا When the translator writes, there they will find everything they wish for, and there they will stay. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he says, O Prophet, this is a binding promise from your Lord. Allah addresses the Prophet ﷺ and He says, This is a binding promise from your Lord, from your Master, Allah. Okay, so now to unpack some of what Allah is saying here. لَهُمْ فِيهَا مَا يَشَاءُونَ خَالِدِينَ Alright, there's, the first thing I'll point out here is there's a little bit of unique sentence structure. 
that basically what it would say is that ma yasha'una lahum fiha ma yasha'una lahum fiha whatever it is that they want whatever it is that they desire it will be given to them it will be delivered to them in it in paradise but that's not what allah says allah says lahum fiha ma yasha'una and this is for the purposes of emphasis that there is no doubt about the fact that they will absolutely get in paradise specifically whatever it is that they could possibly ever want and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in other places in the quran walakum fiha ma tashtahi anfusukum walakum fiha ma tashtahi anfusukum that in paradise you will get whatever it is that you want whatever it is that you desire walakum fiha ma tad'un and you will get whatever it is that you could possibly ask for in surah an-nahl surah number 16 ayah number 31 allah says jannatu adnin the gardens of eden yadkhulunaha they will enter into these gardens tajri min tahti al-anharu rivers streams flowing from beneath these gardens lahum fiha ma yasha'un and they will be get, given they will receive in paradise whatever it is that they want whatever it is that they could ask for and so that's what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here in the beginning of the ayah lahum fiha ma yasha'una khalidina and now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again emphasizes that they will be in paradise for all of eternity khalidin now the real interesting part of the discussion comes in on the second part of the ayah Allah says kana ala rabbika wa'dan mas'ula kana ala first part of it is kana ala rabbika it this is fixed this is an obligation the word ala in the arabic language can sometimes be used to communicate an obligation this is an obligation upon your lord and your master allah Now even that translation I'm not completely comfortable with it and I'll explain why. First and foremost of course this gets into the conversation and there's been a lot of very interesting conversation historically, traditionally, classically about this particular issue and what we basically understand and what we affirm and what we understand and what we realize is that God doesn't owe anyone anything. Allah is above and beyond obligation. Because saying that someone is obligated for something means that they're accountable. Means that there is some type of consequence of not fulfilling your obligations. And Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala does not la yus'alu amma yaf'alu. God is not questioned and asked about what he does or does not do. In the rabbaka fa'alun lima yurid. Allah does whatever it is that he wills, whatever it is that he wants. Yahkumu ma yasha. He decides and decrees whatever he wills. يَفْعَلُ مَا يُرِيدُ He does whatever it is that He wills. يَفْعَلُ مَا يَشَاءُ He is not bound by anything, not restricted by anything, not accountable to anyone, not questioned by anyone, doesn't answer to anyone or anything. Above and beyond all of this, we are accountable to Him. We are, we will be held accountable, we will be held responsible by Him. We answer to Him. We are His subjects, we are His slaves. He doesn't answer to anyone. So how do we exactly understand the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying kana ala rabbika that this is fixed upon your lord and your master Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So when we look within the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in a couple of different places where he says wa kana haqqan alayna nasrul mu'minin in surah ar-rum in surah ar-rum um, surah number 30 ayah number 47 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa kana haqqan alayna It is fixed upon us nasr al-mu'minin to aid to help the believers. Allah says this other places as well. There's a hadith qudsi in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that somebody who takes responsibility steps up and owns the responsibility of the five daily prayers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes upon himself to enter that person into paradise. So this is a frequent theme. This is kind of a style that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala communicates a lot of the promises that he's made to us. And this is a sign of generosity. This is a sign of graciousness. This is a sign of generosity and a sign of graciousness. 
And we're very familiar with this idea. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ Nothing compares to Allah. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى For God is the most exalted of examples. But to just understand the dynamic. Think of it this way. If I work for someone, or if I'm hired by someone to provide a service, and that person is paying me to provide a service, and I perform the service and the person pays me, and the person then thanks me, for the service that I have provided. Did that person have to thank me? No, it was an exchange. I will provide the service, you will pay me. I performed the service and that person paid me. There's nothing past that. But whether it's a thank you or whether it's a tip or whatever it may be, right? We understand that that's a level of appreciation, a level of graciousness on the part of the person. And we, we commend that type of attitude, that type of practice, and we say that this is nobility, this is dignity, this is honor on the part of that person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Kareem, Al-Wadud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the loving and the most noble and the most gracious and the most kind and the most merciful. That's why Allah, one of the attributes of Allah that Allah mentions in the Quran is Shakur. Allah acknowledges the good that we do. He doesn't have to. He doesn't need to, but he appreciates and acknowledges the good that we do. So Allah saying, "Kana ala Rabbika," it is fixed upon your Lord, your Master Allah, is a huge mercy from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. To in a world of instability, in a world of you know that that where we lack, you know. Um, where, where we lack certainty or we lack stability or we, there's, there's a constant flux and a constant you know, turbulence and turmoil that to have that assuredness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah's got your back. Allah is looking out for you. Allah will take care of you. Don't worry. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something. He says wa'dan, that it's a promise. And the scholars mentioned that that word wa'dan is very important here. Because Allah, by, ver by virtue of mentioning that word wa'dan, it clarifies that however God still doesn't owe us anything, God is saying that He will provide this, He has taken responsibility for this, but He's promised it. Because He's promised it. Wallahu la yukhliful mi'ad. And Allah does not defy, Allah does not break His promises. And then it says mas'ula. This is a promise that is asked for, that is requested, a promise that is requested. Now, what does that exactly mean? That is asked for, that is requested. What is this referring to? What is this alluding to? So the scholars mention that the Qur'an actually helps us understand what this is talking about, that this is a promise that is requested, that we will be obedient to Allah, and we will do our best to comply with what Allah has asked of us, and Allah will reward us with paradise, and with His mercy, and with His forgiveness. And this is something that's requested. In the Qur'an itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, in Surah Ali Imran, at the end of Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 194, that this is a dua the believers make. رَبَّنَا وَآتِنَا مَا وَعَدْتَنَا عَلَىٰ رُسُلِكَ Oh Allah, please deliver to us the promises that you made, that you sent your prophets with. You sent your prophets and your messengers with promises of success in the life of the hereafter. If we can obey you in the life of this dunya, please deliver that promise to us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, teaches us a dua, like in Surah Al-Baqarah, the famous dua, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab And not only that, but in um, Surah Al-Zumr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the angels make dua for us. رَبَّنَا وَأَدْخِلْهُمْ جَنَّاتِ عَدِنٍ الَّتِي وَعَدْتَهُمْ O oh Allah, please enter them. The angels pray for us. O oh Allah, please enter them into the gardens of eternity that you have promised them. Please enter them into the gardens of paradise that you promised to them. So meaning this is a dua that we make. This is a dua that the angels make on our behalf. And that's why it means a requested promise. That God will deliver on the promise He made, on the promise that we continue to beg and plead and ask for, even though we were not worthy of it. We didn't necessarily live up to our end of the bargain. 
We didn't always do what we should have done, what we needed to do, but we continued to ask, we continued to beg, we continued to plead, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that promise to overlook our shortcomings, to shower us with His mercy, allow His mercy to carry us forward the rest of the way, and then deliver us the promise that He had made to us. And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about as well within the Qur'an. That that promise is something that the believers will come to see. The Prophet ﷺ even you know, commented on this. The Qur'an says this as well. And the Prophet ﷺ quoted that ayah of the Qur'an. We have found, we realized, we experienced that the promise of God to be true. God fulfilled this promise to us. Has God fulfilled this promise to you? And when the people reach paradise, they will say, Alhamdulillahi ladhi hadana li hadha. They will praise and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for delivering them to paradise as He had promised. So this is the idea. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ also taught us, the Quran teaches us and the Prophet ﷺ also taught us to constantly ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver us, to bring us, to, 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 to enter us into paradise. So, كَانَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ وَعَدًا مَسْؤُولًا The next ayah, ayah number 17. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَوْمَ يَحْشُرُهُمْ وَيَوْمَ يَحْشُرُهُمْ وَمَا يَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَقُولُوا أَأَنْتُمْ أَضْلَلْتُمْ عِبَادِي هَؤُلَاءِ أَمْ هُمْ ضَلُّ السَّبِيلِ When the translator writes, On the day he gathers them all together with those they worship beside him, he will say, was it you, O false gods, false objects of these people's worship, who led these creatures of mine astray? Or did they stray from the path by themselves? Wayoma talks about the day of judgment, the day of resurrection. Wayoma yahshirhum on the day that God, Allah will not only resurrect, but the hashar, the word hashar means to gather everyone together. So Allah will resurrect them and gather them all together. So on the day that Allah will gather them, and not only them, wama ya'buduna, and those things, all those things, all the different objects, this includes both the living and the non-living, the human and the inanimate objects. Whether it was somebody who worshipped a particular prophet, whether they were some of those people that worshipped angels, whether they were some of those people that worshipped other people, or animals, or creatures, or they worshipped the sun, or the moon, or they even worshipped stone and wood and idols, whatever it is that they worshipped. They will be gathered together and all the different things that they worshipped will be gathered together that, that they worshipped other than Allah. فَيَقُولُوا And then Allah will say. And then Allah will say. Meaning Allah will address all the different objects of these people's worship. أَأَنْتُمْ أَضْلَلْتُمْ عِبَادِي Are you the ones who led my slaves astray? Meaning are you the ones who dissuaded these people? Convinced them? You know, argued with them? told them to worship you? أَمْهُمْ ضَلُّ sabil, Or did they find a way to go astray themselves? So some of the Mufassirun specifically mentioned like Mujahid, one of the students of Ibn Abbas, he says, Isa, Uzair, Malaika, that some of the prophets that people worshipped and the angels. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will address them. That are, did you ask them to worship? And this is a question that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala poses other places in the Qur'an. And the answer that, these, that they will give as is coming in the next ayah as well, is also mentioned other places in the Qur'an as well. So for instance, when it comes to the angels, the angels say in Surah Al-Saba, in ayahs 40 and 41, قَالُوا سُبْحَانَكَ أَنْتَ وَلِيُّنَا مِن دُونِهِمْ Oh Allah, we are loyal to you. We don't have any loyalty to these people. We are loyal to you. بَلْ كَانُوا يَعْبُدُونَ الْجِنَّ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِهِمْ مُؤْمِنُونَ They didn't really worship us. What they did was, we never convinced them, we never told them. What they did was they gave in to the shayateen. Shaytan told them to do this. And they put their faith in shaytan instead of believing in you. Isa alayhi salam. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, at the end of Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَىٰ 
think, you know, recall the time. And it's actually telling us that this will happen on the day of judgment, on the day of resurrection. Imagine being there. When Allah will say to Isa alayhi salam, أَأَنْتَ قُلْتَ لِلنَّاسِ Are you the one that said to the people, اِتَّخِذُونِي وَأُمِّيَ إِلَهَيْنِ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ That take me and my mother Mary as objects of worship other than Allah. قَالَ سُبْحَانَكَ Isa alayhi salam will respond by saying, Subhanak. Oh Allah, you are absolutely perfect. All glory be to you. مَا يَكُونُ لِي Why would I do that? What's wrong with me? Why would I ever dare? An akula ma laysa li bihaq. That I would say something that I have absolutely no right and justification to say. In kuntu qultuhu faqad alimta. If I would have said that, you would know. Ta'alamu ma nafsi wa la a'alam ma fi nafsik. You know everything about me. And I only know about you what you have informed me of. You know everything about me, I don't know everything about you, Ya Allah. إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ عَلَّامُ الْغُيُوبِ And you and only you are the knower of all the unseen and the unknown. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another place in the Qur'an in Surah Yunus, Ayahs 28-29, وَقَالَ شُرَكَاؤُهُمْ مَا كُنْتُمْ إِيَّانَا تَعْبُدُونَ فَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ إِن كُنَّا عَنْ عِبَادَتِكُمْ لَغَافِلِينَ The objects of people's worship will be brought on the day of judgment, on the day of resurrection. And they'll be asked. And they will respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying that, Oh Allah, you are the witness between us and between these people. And you know for certain and we, had, we testified before you that we had no idea that they were worshipping us. We had nothing to do with them associating us as partners with you, O Allah. وَإِذَا حُشِرَ النَّاسُ كَانُوا لَكُمْ أَعْدَاءً وَكَانُوا بِعِبَادَتِهِ كَافِرِينَ When humanity will be gathered together, all the different things that people venerated and worshipped and idolized other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will all completely disassociate themselves from the people that used to worship them. In fact, they will become enemies. They will argue against the people that worship them. And they will disassociate themselves. وَهُمْ عَنْ دُعَائِهِمْ غَافِلُونَ They have no idea that people are worshiping them and calling out to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَلَّا سَيَكْفُرُونَ بِعِبَادَتِهِمْ وَيَكُونُونَ عَلَيْهِمْ ضِدَّةً they will disassociate themselves from being worshipped and from the people that worship them and they will in fact oppose them and argue against them on the day of judgment, on the day of resurrection. One of the questions that some have basically posed here and some of the mufassirun like Dahak and Ikrima and others have answered this question. And again, it's a very obvious question. Imam Qurtubi mentions this. But some pose the question here that Okay, this we understand in the case of Isa alayhi salam, because Allah mentions that dialogue in the Qur'an, it's Isa alayhi salam, he's a human being. We understand in the case of the angels. It's mentioned in the Qur'an, they're angels, etc. But what about the idols? How can a dialogue happen with an idol made out of stone? So they answer the question that, فَإِن كَانَتِ الْأَصْنَامُ الَّتِي تُعْبَدُ تُحْشَرُ فَكَيْفَ تَنْتِقُوا وَهِيَ جَمَادٌ how are they going to speak? They're inanimate objects. So the answer is, يُنْتِقُوا هَاللَّهُ تَعَالَى يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ كَمَا يُنْتِقُوا الْأَيْدِي وَالْأَرْجُلِ You are baffled by the fact that God could make stone speak on the day of judgment, on the day of resurrection? When Allah tells us, وَتُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ وَتَشْهَدُوا أَرْجُلُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ Allah tells us that their own hands will speak against them. وَجُلُودُهُمْ Allah says their feet will testify against them. Allah says their skin will speak out against them about what they used to do. This is not beyond the power and the capacity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there's a, very, there's a couple of linguistic curiosities in this particular ayah. Mostly, and even if you're not looking at the ayah, you can hear it here. Allah says, فَيَقُولُوا When Allah will question them, He says, أَأَنْتُمْ أَضْلَلْتُمْ أَأَنْتُمْ أَضْلَلْتُمْ Right? You hear that little repetition of the tum? You'll, inshallah, especially the Qur'an intensive students, you'll understand exactly why I say that that's repetition. But at some level, you can even hear that. And basically, أَضْلَلْتُمْ already means that, did you lead them astray? 
But Allah says, Antum, and you guys know what Antum means. Antum means all of you. Did all of you lead them astray? And Adlaltum already has the meaning of all of you built into it. So it's, saying, it's like saying all of you, all of you. So why does Allah repeat the Antum when the meaning of Antum is already built into the word Adlaltum? And then at the end of the ayah, Allah says, Amhum dallu as sabila. The word dallu already has the meaning of hum built into it. Or did they lose the way? Did they themselves go astray? So again, Allah says hum, when the meaning of hum is already built into the word dallu. So it's again, they, they. It's, it's repeating it. Why does Allah repeat that? Because it's, it's for a level of emphasis. And specifically, specifically this style is used when admonishing someone. In classical Arabic, this is used when admonishing someone. When holding someone accountable. Like, te- like um, you know, questioning someone in court. Isa alayhi salam, of course, did nothing wrong. But because it's like a court-like scene where Allah is questioning him, to be fair, to establish justice, what Allah, A'anta qulta? A'anta qulta? You hear it there again. Did you? You? Did you say this? So when you're questioning someone, this is a style in Arabic. So Allah says, "Antum, adlaytum? Did you, you, lead them astray? Amhum dalu as sabil, or did they themselves go astray?" And that communicates the harshness of the tone to call them out like that. You, them, right? And it and it displays and shows the severity of the situation. How when it comes to this issue of shirk, Allah has no realization of what a scary and also serious statement this is. But when it comes to the issue of shirk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unforgiving. To even say the word unforgiving is very scary. But Allah tells us in the Quran, doesn't He? Inna Allah لا يغفر أن يشرك به. Allah will not forgive shirk. Never. So to communicate the severity of the situation, the seriousness of the issue, Allah uses this term. One of the other grammatical and linguistic curiosities from the balagha of this ayah is Allah says, "Amhum dalu as sabila." Amhum dalu as sabil. Or did they? Lose the way. Now, typically in the Quran, when Allah talks about losing the way, there's a preposition that's used. Dalla anis sabil. The preposition an is used to stray from the path. That sounds familiar, right? To stray from the path. An. Here, Allah doesn't use the preposition of an. He just said dalu instead of saying anis sabil as sabil. Directly. Because what's very fascinating about this, that Ar-Razi mentions, that illa anna al-insana idha kana mutanahiyan fi tafriti wa qillati al-ihtiyati yuqalu dhal al-sabil. If somebody gets lost, so imagine, use the example of somebody driving. If someone's driving, trying to follow directions, has looked up the directions, has looked at a map, has a GPS on, or whatever the case may be, has made an effort, is trying to pay attention to the street signs, and then makes a wrong turn and gets a little lost, that dalla an sabil He got off, he got away from the correct route. But if somebody deliberately and ignorantly and foolishly is just kind of driving, and even when asked, do you know where you're going? Eh, who cares? Well, don't you think you should look up where you're going, the directions, the address, something? Eh, who cares? Well, shouldn't you at least pay attention to where you're going? Eh, who cares? When somebody has that type of just completely negligent attitude, careless attitude, and then that person gets lost, the Arabs would not use the preposition to almost communicate the idea that that person didn't get lost, that person wanted to be lost. 
That person was trying to be lost. That person didn't care at all. That person asked for this. And that's once again what it's saying here. Because the Qur'an came. The Prophet ﷺ came. Everything was laid out. And then a person still worshipped stone, or a human, or an angel, or whatever it was. That's a person kind of resigning themselves to this fate. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicates it by saying that this person was, it's like this person was trying to be astray. They themselves led their own selves astray. It's all on them. It's all their problem. And another very powerful, you know, part of the eloquence of this ayah that Ibn Ashur points out is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He's talking, these people that Allah is interrogating, questioning, holding accountable, they are people who did shirk, the greatest crime possible. ظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ The greatest crime possible. But when Allah speaks about them, what does He call them? أَأَنْتُمْ أَضْلَلْتُمْ Look at the eye everyone. أَأَنْتُمْ أَضْلَلْتُمْ عِبَادِي What does Allah call them? My slaves. Fascinating. That's almost like a term of endearment. My slaves. Allah is saying. Why does Allah refer to them as His slaves? They associated partners to Allah. They rejected the guidance from Allah. They denied the messenger of Allah. Why does Allah refer to them as His slaves? And so, two things the scholars point out here. Number one, is that because in the life of the hereafter, it was in the life of the world that they denied and rejected, but on the life, in the life of the hereafter, on the day of judgment, it will become an undeniable reality. And they will accept their fate. رَبَّنَا أَبَصَرْنَا وَسَمِعْنَا فَرْجِعْنَا نَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا إِنَّا مُوقِنُونَ Oh Allah, now we have seen, now we have heard, please return us back, give us another chance, please, 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 because now we fully believe. Now they'll understand and they'll realize. But it's too little too late. And the second, you know, um, thing that the second reflection that some of the scholars mention in light of Allah referring to them as His slaves is that this still communicates the fact that Allah never wanted this fate for them. Allah wanted them to submit. Allah told them to submit. Allah told them to comply. But they just kept on rejecting it, kept on refusing. They chose this path for themselves. And while we're on the topic of this ubudiyah, being a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, submitting to Allah, one of the scholars, he's written something very beautiful about this concept of submitting to Allah and complying to Allah's command and Allah's law. He says, Al-ibadatu an yuti'a al-abidu awamira ma'budihi. The concept of ibadah is to obey and comply with the commands of the Lord and the Master. فَيَنْبَغِي أَنْ نَنْظُرَ فِي كُلِّ مَنْ لَهُ أَمْرٌ نُطِيعُهُ So we have to. See, a lot of times, and when the brothers was asking me about this, that a lot of times we might talk about like shirk and disbelief and, and, and we can have trouble kind of relating to it. It can very quickly become the type of you know, discussion that's talking about those other people. Because shirk is just so far and distant from our minds, like it's inconceivable for us. Or at least we feel that way. And to a certain degree, while we shouldn't completely treat ourselves as being immune, but having confidence in your faith is also very important. That I would rather die than ever associate a partner to God. That confirmation of faith is important. So he says that to understand and appreciate how we can reflect on this and how we can take from this and how this can also have meaning and purpose for us, he mentions that you know, the, the, at the core of this slavery to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the idea of compliance and obedience. And so we all have influences within our lives. And there are different levels of compliance and obedience. 
And it's not that being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means we defy every other authority. Allah Himself talks to us about the authority of our parents or the authority of those who govern or watch or protect us, right? And so on and so forth. But what we do have to pay attention to is that do we take influence from others? Are we persuaded or dissuaded by other forces? in a manner, in a way, that it ends up involving the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's really a test. We understand that we're not physically bowing down and doing shirk in front of an idol. But there is another deeper spiritual level of this discussion, that I can become so subservient to money, that the pursuit of money, that the desire to acquire more wealth, does it lead me to compromise my relationship with Allah? Would I be willing to engage in something, do something that Allah has prohibited? Allah has forbidden me from doing. If it leads me to achieve or to comply with something else that I want or I desire. That's a question we all have to ask ourselves. And therein lies the lesson. Because even those who ended up prostrating or bowing in front of an idol, humanity just didn't get there. Many of these people were the progeny and the offspring and the generations that came after prophets and messengers and believers and followers of prophets and messengers. They didn't just wake up one morning and be like, oh, idol, okay, cool. But there was this slow, steady decline, this downward spiral, this compromising of values and ethics and morality and compliance and prioritization. And it eventually led to a corruption that starts from the exterior and makes its way interior, inside, until the heart becomes completely corrupted. And the heart becomes so polluted that then it can't see the truth anymore. So that's something very important, very profound to pay a lot of attention to. Now, the next two ayat, ayat number eighteen. I'll read the translation of this just so it completes kind of the, the, the thought. They will say, may you be exalted. We ourselves would never take masters other than you, O Allah. We would never dare worship anyone other than, other than you, O Allah. But you granted them and their forefathers pleasures in this life until they forgot your reminder. And then they were ruined. That will be the response. And it's time for Salat al-Isha, so we don't have time to get into the um, analysis and the explanation of the ayah and the verse. So we'll pause here, inshallah. But keep in mind exactly where we've left off, so inshallah we'll pick up from here in the next session. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that's been said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasafirku wa natubu ilayk. Very quick. And